This is where I spent three years of my graduation at, PMA Hostel, one of the residential accommodations for female students of Jamia Millia Islamia, a central university located here in Delhi, India. And more than the university's name, I had repeated the name of my hostel, BMA. Unfortunately, I took my own time to realize that the history lessons had failed me and that I should put some respect on this name. So, this is a story of undervalued history, which starts with BMA and ends at Jamia Millia Islamia. B. Amma, her full name Abadi Banu Begum, was just five years old when the 1857 revolt took place. Her father, Sheikh Muzaffar Ali, a cavalry soldier and her extended family, participated in the struggle. Post uprising, more than 250 members of her extended family were killed, and their heads were put on display at Delhi's Khuni Darwaza. Here were three sons of the last Mughal emperor. Bahadur Shah Zafar were stripped naked and shot at point-blank range on the orders of British Major Hudson. Piyama's father sustained grave injuries. She, along with her brother and mother, was sent to Rampur State. And later, her father rejoined them but with a changed identity and for several years lived as a refugee. Piyama was widowed at 28. and despair and poverty, she shouldered the responsibility of raising six children striving to make them English medium educated. B. Amma was the mother of the Ali brothers. She was a very popular lady who promoted women's education in those days, who promoted independence and self-sufficiency, who promoted self-respect and dignity amongst individuals and asked people to stand for just cause. Her resolve and foresight are preserved in various records, including those of her son, Muhammad Ali, the younger of the famous duo Ali brothers. Her efforts paid off. The Ali brothers studied at Aligarh Muslim University, the Muhammadan Anglo-Oriental College, and Muhammad Ali went ahead to Lincoln College, Oxford, to study modern history. Muhammad Ali is a very, very versatile scholar, not only of Islamic literature of Islamic studies, but literature, politics, journalism. He has a wonderful language. His newspaper, Comrade, you know, was so popular that even the British used to wait for that weekly to come and read. He was such a versatile person. And so was Shaukat Ali. So Bihamma gave the best of education to her sons despite being a widow. And she really inculcated great value, not only in her sons, but in the genera younger generation then. After returning to India, he served in the Baroda Civil Service and in 1910, tired of this job, he left it. In 1911, he started his journalistic venture with Comrade magazine and big brother Shaukat Ali aided him throughout. He drew attention to Hindu-Muslim unity, emphasizing how otherwise they were deemed to fail ignominiously. Soon, Comrade's office in Kuchai Chalan shifted from Calcutta to here in Old Delhi and became a political salon. For Urdu readers, Muhammad Ali started Hamdard magazine in 1913. The weekly publications did not sit right with British colonial rule and they both were banned in 1914. But the Ali brothers had more ways to resist. In colonial North India, they were out on a political voyage, making speeches, galvanizing masses, and even awakening ulemas. When Gandhi met Muhammad Ali for the first time in Delhi in 1915, he called it love at first sight. But the public presence of the Ali brothers was to be cut short soon. On 15th May 1915, the police interned the Ali brothers at Mehroli, asking them to abstain from political meetings. On that day, Thousands congregated after Friday prayers at Delhi's Juma Masjid to bid adieu to the two patriots who had done all they could to promote their cause. But their exile in Mehruli brought more public attention. So, they were kept moving in detention from Mehruli to Lansdowne and finally Chindwara. The saga of their resolve and resistance was reaching corners and the protests for their release ensued. 
in the absence of her sons, Biyamma took the charge. Then Muhammad Ali, who was chosen as the president of the Muslim League, could not be at its annual meeting in 1917 because he was still incarcerated. Biyamma spoke on his behalf while his photograph occupied the presidential chair. And at the Congress session, she sat next to Sarojini Naidu and Annie Besant. When the latter, Annie Besant, the British social reformer who started the Home Rule League, was arrested, Biyamma actively campaigned for her release. During one of such anti-British campaigns, Gandhi met her. This, the famous Gandhi cap, is actually Biyamma's creation, and she handed it for him. Gandhi foresighted Biyamma to be instrumental in the long road for freedom, and she exhibited the same specimen of valour and conviction in her speeches as she had nurtured in her sons. When the Khilafat movement was launched, she told her uh, sons uh, to work for it till their death. And there was a, there's a very popular refrain that became um, very, very popular those days, which goes like, Boli bi amma Muhammad Ali ki ja beta khilafat pe de do. Her words were fiery. Even the cats and dogs of my country do not deserve to be ruled by the British, she declared in one of her speeches. With her campaigning, donations for the freedom struggle escalated. Gandhi assured her of the Ali brothers' release. Mushirul Hassan, a historian and former vice chancellor of Jamia Millia Islamia, writes that Muhammad Ali was valuable to Gandhi, both as an issue on which to cement a communal concordat and also because he considered him to be a splendid example of Ganga Jamuni Tehzeeb, syncretic fusion of Hindu Muslim cultures in the Indo Gangetic belt. In September 1917, the government had a conditional offer of their release. In one such meeting for their release, Piyamma walked in and said that if the Ali brothers were to accept any terms contradicting the dictates of their faith or the interest of their country, she herself would throttle them that instant. Ultimately, it took the end of the First World War to restart the negotiations on their release. And after his release, Muhammad Ali led a joint Hindu-Muslim deputation to the Viceroy on the issue of Khilafat, but the mission failed. When he returned to Bombay on 4th October 1920, the non-cooperation resolution had been adopted by the Calcutta Congress and the Khilafat movement had reached deeper grounds. This intersection of these two mass movements was to become historic. Both forces joined. It was a common struggle now and it was gaining ground in faces. And several educational institutions were also in attendance. On 12th October 1920, Gandhi fastening sentences in Hindustani asked the students of Mohammedan Anglo-Oriental College, how can you remain even for an hour in an institution in which you are obliged to put up with a union jack and profess your loyalty to a governor or other high-ranking officials when in fact you are not loyal? His call was heeded by a small group of students. Before Mahatma Gandhi wed and, the, and what prompted the students to request Ma, uh, Muhammad Ali to invite Mahatma Gandhi was the fact that on the 10th of October, a letter was found addressed to the Viceroy, Viceroy Lytton, which said that they wanted to train the Indian Muslims through this college, that is the Aligarh College, to be loyal servants of the Crown. Crown meaning the British. And that is the reason why some students came to Muhammad Ali and asked him. But although this letter was hushed up, but yet some students came to know and they requested, Mahatma, uh, requested Muhammad Ali Johar to invite Mahatma Gandhi. The next day, the Ali brothers reached their beloved alma mater and unlike their yesterday's speech in non-cooperation, it was their teary eyes bidding goodbyes. Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali walked into the hall. When they walked in the hall, they made very brief two two minute speeches, the sum total of which I will put it in the Ashar Bade Beabru Hoke Tere Kuche Se Ham Nikle. They had a lot of expectation from their college, but this kind of a response shocked them and they decided to cut off all connections with the college. So they told the students that now we are leaving the college and we are going and we have nothing to do with you all. 
this actually shook the students this decision of muhammad ali johar shook the students because he had he was greatly admired by the student the despair found more hearts young zakir hussain who would later become the first muslim president of india spoke words of courage and soon this courage transpired into a concrete plan an independent national university and the news caused waves of frenzy and discussions and roadmaps followed on 27th october when the college's trustees met muhammad ali reiterated gandhi's words of a day before to refuse grants from the british government but his appeals were declined so the small but strong headed spinter of muhammad ali created their own identity jamia millia islamia and finally we are here after two days the foundation committee met quite a handful of intellectuals and shaykhul hind maulana mahmood hassan laid the foundation stone here at aligarh the work of establishing the university was tiring the conviction stronger the administration was dissuading this expansion and the resistance it carried in every possible way but jamia persisted over 700 students responded to the call of the non cooperation movement meanwhile Muhammad Ali and B Amma were traveling across the country for the non-cooperation program. Around the country went popular lore. So spoke the mother of Muhammad Ali, "Give your life, my son, for the Khilafat." In September 1921, Muhammad Ali was arrested. When the Khilafat Conference at Karachi declared it impermissible for Muslims to serve the British army or police. For the famous trial of the Ali brothers and five others, the Khalid Dinah Hall in Karachi had to be converted into a court. Maulana's granddaughter Aziz Fatima yes this is her in this photo with Gandhi recalls that during these trials bi amma and muhammad ali's wife amjadi banu begum made fiery speeches before the tightly packed crowd bi amma spoke as the president of the all india ladies conference at ahmedabad congress in december 1921 appealing to unite for without cooperation among the different communities we can't liberate our country to live peaceful and honorable lives addressing a mass meeting in punjab she said that the coming of swaraj was certain if women had a heart to make sacrifices for the cause her presence in the freedom movement galvanized the masses and encouraged women to be a part of the struggle by february 1922 she had addressed large gatherings in more than 13 cities and towns of bihar during this time at bartoli a resolution was adopted under gandhi's leadership to withdraw the non cooperation movement jamia sent it volunteers across popularizing the program next month when gandhi was arrested he sent a special message to bi amma asking her to continue the movement and seeking her prayers some relief reached her when muhammad ali was released jamia welcomed him but things went all good the ali brothers were of the opinion to discontinue jamia and by the end of khilafat an economic crisis was looming large over jamia jamia was always running on a crunch who had no infrastructure no luxuries no chairs to sit on no no building nothing they were living in tents the classes were under the trees the best of educations jamia students were being trained as nationalist students they were told about non cooperation movement they were told about dignity of their country and how you should assert your dignity and liberty and fight for india's freedom so they were told taught all this and they were asked to go around in the neighboring areas and inspire people speak to them to come forward and fight for india's freedom also in this november pm ma took a last breath a woman who history can only remember for her courage and as for jamia spirit it was decided when members of the foundation committee met on 28th january 1925 at sharif mansal the opinion tilted in jamia's favor and then in 1925 jamia was moved here to karol bag new delhi as for the money hakim ajmal khan's pockets and dr m a ansari and abdul majid khwaja's campaigning tours withheld the worst early in february 1926 The three friends, Dr. Zakir Hussain, Dr. Abid Hussain, and Dr. Muhammad Mujib, left Germany to serve Jamia, folding their wallets, voluntarily reducing their salaries. The Simon Commission escalated. Many of Jamia's founding fathers were arrested. 
leaving the new university to fend for itself. Despite the continuing incarceration of many of Jamia's leaders, its students participated in the Bardoli Satyagraha, where farmers resisted revised land revenue tax. Finally, in March 1933, Jamia shifted here to Okla, which was back then a nondescript village on the southern outskirts of Delhi, which was still clouding Jamia's ambitions. But the spirit was high. By 1935, a plot of land was given to them on the banks of River Yamuna, which was way off from Delhi. So it was a quite a distant, far-flung place that they had got. But yet they had got a permanent place of their own. So in 1935, this building, the primary school building, was built for Jamia Millia Islamia. And in 1939, as late as 1939, Jamia was registered as an educational society. In the early 1940s, when the slogans of "Do or Die" chanted the crowds in the Quit India movement, Jamia walked along. Again, many were arrested, including Zakir Hussain. In the tarnish of partition, Jamia was not spared. Its buildings on the Karolbagh campus were attacked by mobs, ransacked, and an entire family was killed. Maktaba Jamia, its printing press alone lost books worth seven lakhs in Assam, but Jamia focused on reconciliation. On one end, it was involved in relief works at the evacuee camps, and on the other, hosted the immigrating masses. Post partition, the financial support of its main patrons, the Muslim princely rulers, ended. It was an economic crunch again. Even though Jamia had been extolled for its participation in the freedom struggle. Words were no sooner turned into deeds. In bits and pieces, monetary funds were released, and then help came as government recommendations of thirty-eight thousand rupees a year for enhancement of salaries. A list of restraining terms and conditions came attached. Further, the prospective status of Jamia as a recognized university was still unclear, despite Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru himself having a high opinion of Jamia. But Jamia continued expanding. Despite the hiccups, in 1988 it became a central university. The journey ahead was not a bed of roses for Jamia, but it persisted, resisting time and again. Maybe it is the courage of B. Amma, Muhammad Ali Johar, and the likes of them that still keeps living and inspiring. <laughs>